Well, hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome. Welcome. Good to see you for story and art tonight. Hey, um, I hope you're doing well and have had a great day. I'm here. I forgot to turn on a light over there. So let me put on pause and um, hang on. There, that's a little better, a little brighter. Anyway, um, so yeah, so I've got another story recorded. We, I've got the grand, all five grandkids here at my daughter's house for one more night. So um, I'm going to do another premiere for tonight. And then um, hopefully Layla and I will be back live tomorrow night. So that ought to be fun. But so this is a book I thought I had read to you, but I went back and looked and I realized I'd had it checked out and wanted to read it. And then I didn't read it and it got returned while I was in Africa and all that kind of stuff. So I have it here. It is um, called um, The Book Res Rescuer. And the story is written by, oops, let's see. There it is. Sue Macy. And um, she has written close to two dozen books for children and young adults, many of which focus on sports and women in history. Her um, book rescuer, which is the one I'm going to read, is won the 2020 Sydney Taylor Picture Book Award. She's done a whole lot of things, and she just has had a real interest in, um, she was a kind of a tomboy, and she worked for Scholastic as a kid and did things differently and was sports-wise. She worked for Scholastic um, as an editor for quite some time, and um, so she just, as, her, as she says, her dad was a certified public accountant, which means he worked for several days a week, every income tax season from January till April. And she knew that that wasn't what she wanted to do. So she's the one who's written this book and it's really quite interesting. She did a lot of the research and about this person. It is another one of our historical nonfictions. And the illustrator um, is this gentleman who we've did a book recently that he did, Stacy um, Innerst. Um, he read all the pedants, screeds, and strictures, but don't believe in anything that can't be told in colored pictures. Uh, that's his quote on his website. He's a painter, children's book artist, and illustrator, and his books have received a host of starred reviews. And I think if I show you these, you will recognize some, the Lady Liberty. I don't think I read the Gins, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg that he did, um, but he's done some really amazing books, nonfiction, and um, it's just a really treat to have him with this book. Uh, the illustrations, I think you're really gonna like it. Let me get my story up here. And the book is called The Book Rescuer, and it's just, you know, if you're going to rescue something besides animals, you might as well rescue a book, right? But this person rescued so much more than just books, and it's pretty fascinating. Another bit of our history that gets hidden and lost, and until you find it in a picture book, you never know about it. So here it is, The Book Rescuer, How a Mensch from Massachusetts Saved Yiddish Literature for Generations to Come. The Book Rescuer. I love the illustrations. Kumar, sit down, I want to tell you a story. It starts a long time ago when Aaron Lansky's 16-year-old grandma left Eastern Europe for the United States. <coughs> she didn't bring much with her, just a cardboard suitcase with some precious items from her old life, a goose-down pillow, a pair of candlesticks, and a photograph of her mama and papa who stayed on in Europe. 
and a few books in Yiddish, the everyday language of Eastern European Jews. After a long ocean voyage, Aaron's grandma reached New York City where her older brother was waiting. He greeted her, took the suitcase, and tossed it into the Hudson River. Oi, gewald! He said it was time to break with the past and think about the future. Aaron never forgot that story. Who could? It made him curious about the life his grandma left behind. Make no mistake, Aaron was an all-American boy. He grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, horsing around with his two brothers. He joined the Boy Scouts. He watched Star Trek. He also loved books. Aaron received his first library card at age four. From that time forward, he read everything he could get his hands on. Is it a surprise then that books would end up playing a big part in Aaron's life? Of course not. In college, he decided to study Jewish history by reading novels written by Jews of the past. He felt that they were the perfect way to understand how Jewish people lived. But many of the books Aaron wanted to read were written in Yiddish. So nu. First, he had to learn the language. <clears throat> During the early decades of the 20th century, as many as 13 million people around the world spoke Yiddish. By the time Aaron was growing up in the 1960s, though, Yiddish was as aftsaurus in trouble. Nazi Germany and its allies killed millions of Yiddish-speaking Jews in World War II from 1939 to 1945. Other Yiddish speakers fled Eastern Europe and raised their children in countries where they learned the local language instead of Yiddish. Although Aaron was the grandson of Eastern European immigrants, he knew only those Yiddish words that had entered the English language, words like, words like bagel and klutz and nosh and glitch. No one ever spoke Yiddish to me, to my brothers, or to anyone else our age, he said. Like many other first-generation American Jews, Aaron's parents wanted their kinder to fit in by speaking and reading English. Hmm. That's how my grandfather felt. As Yiddish speakers disappeared, so did books written in Yiddish. Students like Aaron had a hard time finding Yiddish books for school. That's why he was stunned when he visited his hometown rabbi and spotted a basket filled with Yiddish books on the floor of his office. What were they doing there? The rabbi said he intended to bury them. What? Aaron could have plotzed. Destroying Yiddish books was like erasing Jewish history, but these books were no longer useful, the rabbi explained, and burying them was a sign of respect. Aaron was not having it. With the rabbi's blessing, he took everything in the basket. Aaron said Yiddish books were the portable homeland of the Jewish people. What did he mean by that? Before the founding of Israel in 1948, Jews didn't have their own homeland. Instead, they lived in countries all over the world. It was through books that Jews recorded and shared their experiences and beliefs. Books are big enough and powerful enough to define and contain identity, said Aaron. Aaron's search for Yiddish books continued in Montreal, Canada where he had started graduate school. Soon he was flooded with donations. He collected so many books that he could hardly find room to sleep in his apartment. Ve Izmir. At the same time, his parents said their house was getting crowded with baskets of books from Aaron's rabbi. They were starting to worry that the second story would collapse from the added weight.
As the books piled up, Aaron realized he was no longer interested in simply gathering enough for his own use. Now he wanted to save as many Yiddish books as possible. So what did he do? I'll tell you. He took time off from graduate school and hauled his entire library back to Massachusetts. Then he went on to see the leaders of the biggest Jewish organization in the country. If we don't save these books now, they'll be lost forever, Aaron told them. But the leaders shook their heads. They said Yiddish was a language whose time had passed. Oops. Sorry. Fortunately, Aaron wouldn't take no for an answer. He rented space in an old factory building and founded the Yiddish Book Center, dedicated to collecting unwanted Yiddish books. After a reporter from the Boston Globe wrote an article about the center, boxes of books started to arrive. So did frantic phone calls. One particular call came at midnight from a friend of Aaron's in New York City. She had found a dumpster full of Yiddish books, she said, and it was scheduled to be hauled off to the trash heap later that day. What's more, the weather forecasters were predicting rain. It was snowing in Massachusetts that night, and the roads were icy, but Aaron rushed to the railroad station to catch the 2 a.m. train to New York. As the sun rose and the rain fell, Aaron and a group of friends rummaged through the giant garbage container. It was filled with thousands of books, emptied out at a nearby building that had once housed a Yiddish organization. Aaron and his buddies managed to get close to 5,000 of them into a rented truck, which he drove all the way home. Aaron also set out on less hazardous trips to collect books offered up by elder Jews. He drove to houses and apartments in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and beyond. The people he visited called him young man, young man, and piled him with food as they and plied him with food as they shared their stories over tea and cake and Kugel, they told Aaron about their jobs, their families, their communities. Most of all, they told him about their books. These men and women handed Aaron one book at a time, their eyes filling with tears as they recounted when they bought it and what it meant to them. We didn't eat much, one woman told Aaron, but we always bought a book. It was a necessity of life. Aaron felt their sadness at having no family members who could read their prized possessions, and he saw their relief once they realized they could trust him to keep their books safe. When Aaron founded the Yiddish Book Center in 1980, experts believed there might only be 70,000 Yiddish books left in the world. He collected that many in six months. He kept going, and wouldn't you know it, people started paying attention. In 1989, Aaron won an award known as a MacArthur Genius Grant, given to people who make a difference in the world. The MacArthur Foundation praised Aaron for giving Yiddish culture new life and introducing it to new generations. Aaron's accomplishments certainly would have made his grandma Gvel, although the suitcase she brought to the New York is long gone. Aaron has kept her story alive by saving a million and a half Yiddish books. Wow! But the books don't just sit around collecting dust. Aaron shares them with schools and libraries, and uses them in a program about lit Yiddish literature. Between their covers, he said, the voices of my grandmother's world can still be heard. Look at that. I love this illustration. Oh, the grandmother's world to the modern world. 
by Aaron and afterward. I was 24 years old when I first embarked on the adventures described in this book. What have my colleagues and I been doing in the almost four decades decades since? Well, we're still collecting books, which is amazing when you consider that it's been almost a century since Congress cut off mass Jewish immigration to America. Somehow, boxes of Yiddish books still arrive every day, and we're still heading out on the road to find more. Next week, for example, we're set off to Poland, where only known copy of Isaac Bashevitz Singer's first literary work recently surfaced in his hometown of Bilgoraj. It's one thing to rescue Yiddish, Yiddish books. It's quite another to get people to read them. 20 years ago, we decided to digitize our titles, and 10 years ago, we placed them online, available for free to anyone who wanted to read them. Would you believe they've since been downloaded more than two and a half million times, often by younger readers who learned Yiddish in college? 43 people work with me at the Yiddish Book Center nowadays. We're racing against time to save Jews' stories as well as their books. We're training a new generation of Yiddish translators. We're releasing a new textbook that will make learning Yiddish quicker, easier, and more fun. And we're offering exciting educational programs for high school students, college students, 20-somethings, and adults. I'll admit it. Racing around in a rattletrap truck in search of dusty books was a lot of fun. But what we're doing now, opening up these books, excavating the lost civilization they contain, and sharing its treasures with the world, that's even better. After all these years, I can't wait to see what happens next. Oh my gosh, what a mission to have and what an exciting thing to have done. He says, if you walk down any street on the Lower East Side of New York City in the beginning of the 20th century, your ears would be bombarded with Yiddish. Peddlers hawking their goods, customers haggling for better prices, parents yelling for their kids to come to dinner would be all speaking Yiddish. More than 2 million Jews immigrated to the United States from 1881 to 1924, and Yiddish was the main language of many of them. They gave rise to a vibrant Yiddish press with 150 Yiddish newspapers and periodicals de debuting by 1914 in New York alone, as well as a lively Yiddish, Yiddish theater scene, and in the 1930s, a healthy offering of Yiddish radio programs. Wow. Today, there are only about 150,000 people who speak Yiddish at home in the United States. Many are Hasidic Jews, following the ultra-Orthodox religious practices and maintaining their historic connection to Yiddish as their everyday language. Others are heritage speakers, elderly G Jews who grew up speaking Yiddish, or younger ones who heard it in their homes. There is also a small but growing number of people actively studying Yiddish in the United States and Europe. Some of them are non-religious Jews who see the language as a way to connect with their history and culture. But there are also non-Jews who are passionate about language and its literature. Thanks to the Yiddish Book Center, people learning Yiddish today and those interested in Yiddish literature have plenty of resources. The center has uploaded more than 11,000 adult books and more than 800 children's books from its collection, offering them for free to introduce interested readers on its website, yiddishbookcenter.org. The site also features Yiddish and English oral history videos, audiobooks in Yiddish, and lectures given by Yiddish writers that were recorded as far back as 1935, some in English, others in Yiddish. The center continues to produce translations of books and stories so English speakers can access some of the material as well. Wow! And the illustrator's note. The pictures in this book were inspired by the extraordinary vision of Mark Chagall. 
There is perhaps no painter who conveyed the visual language of his culture more intimately and poetically than Chagall, and I've loved his work for as long as I can remember. He was born in 1887 in Vitsbrsk, Russia, to a poor Orthodox Jewish family. His success as a modern painter took him all over the world, including the art centers of Paris and New York. <clears throat> Yet the exuberant motifs of his compositions were steeped in the characters and architecture of his early life in the chateau. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the Yiddish words. I had a good fortune to grow up in a home where people who appreciated great art and literature and whose walls were lined with books. My mother was a librarian and my father a journalist and writer. Of particular interest to me was a set of tiny books called The Pocket Library of Great Art, which were full of colorful plates of paintings by Klee, Duffy, Utrillo, Cezanne, Renoir, and of course, Marc Chagall. Those books were my touchstone for what painting could be and images and that I peered over as a child filled my uncluttered mind with color, form, and pure expression. Chagall in particular showed me a fantastic world that was unbound by time, space, or gravity, and yet still very acceptable and human. As an illustrator of picture book biographies, I have the opportunity to become a student of vast array of subjects and personalities. My favorite part of research process is discovering and finding inspiration in a world that I'm attempting to illustrate. When I first read the manuscript for this book and was introduced to Aaron Lansky's noble mission, I realized that I had some catching up to do. I had very little knowledge of Yiddish culture or history, and what little I knew was from life depicted in Chagall's swirling paintings. So I went back to the beginning and to the pocket library. It was right where I left it. Thank goodness there are people in this world that keep and sometimes rescue books. Wow. So and the book goes on, it has a glossary of Yiddish words. It just didn't have pronunciation to help me out. Uh, that would have been nice. One of the note I thought was interesting, it says, note, Yiddish books like Hebrew books are written and read from right to left, and the spines of the books are on the left. Compared to books in English, they are read back to front. Wow. That's pretty cool. Again, there's some things about the history, outwitting history, the amazing adventures of a man who rescued a million Yiddish books. That's an adult book on that whole subject in the Yiddish Book Center, uh, where it is some source notes that were done here. I love that it has that for a nonfiction book, has the references, which is always really important to teach kids. Um, and then, of course, the author's, um, the way she dedicated it. I wanted to show you something, just a sec. Let me pull this up and go to here, um, back, some work by Chagall. So you can see the influence that the, um, that the illustrator had, had by Chagall's work, uh, particularly even like some of these here. And that Yes, I can see how he would be inspired and influenced. Very cool. It's always fun to go look at uh, references for whoever inspired someone um, in that. And I can see how um, would have gotten that notion of this kind of illustration from Chagall's work. Wow. Anyway, you guys, that is the book rescuer, and boy, what a life to rescue books. I get to read them. He got to rescue them. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. I hope you enjoyed this tonight, um, a little bit of the history and nonfiction that we find in children's literature. You know, it's one of my favorite sections and 
favorite parts to find out and the little bits of pieces that we learn and add to our knowledge and then we can think about if we want to learn more. Yeah, I think Chagall is a good inspiration for a lot of different artwork. And um, this particular illustrator did a good job. What was his name again? Oh, shoot. Why did I forget his name? Isaac, uh, no, Stacy. Uh, here it is. Stacy. I lost it. Stacy Ixon, I think what it was. Anyway, you guys, that's it for tonight. And I thank you for being here and thank you for spending some time with me. And I hope you enjoy this premiere. And uh, Layla and I are going to try to be back with you tomorrow night at live. And until then, it's been a delight. I hope your buckets got filled up with a little bit of fun from this story and that you enjoyed it. And I will see you next time. And until then, keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. It's all around you. You know, and the first place you'll find it is when you go look in your mirror. And I will see you on the next show. All we need is a place to be and a few good friends for some company. If you'd like to stay, you don't have to leave. We'll leave the lights on and the door unlocked. If you drop on by, you don't have to knock. We're happy to share whatever we've got. 